Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube live number 21, we're going to roll the 6 and 12 SN7 tubes and a whole bunch more stuff. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. In tube lab number 19 through 20, part A and part B, we looked at my prototype dual mono 6 or 12 SN7 line preamp. This week we're going to have some fun and review tubes using that preamp. And while we're at it, we'll do a mini review of the preamp itself and have a look at some possible improvements. If you want some of the history of the 6SN7 and things to watch out for regarding the various different generations and power handling capabilities, please watch tube lab number 10. I'll put a link below for you. Okay, up first is my HitRay 12SN7 GTA. Now HitRay was a joint venture company formed by Hitachi of Japan and Raytheon of the USA with, I believe, all the tubes made in Japan. Let's have a quick look at it. It's got a really nice clean base. The hit rays had these big, big letters on them. Look at the pins in the base. That's just pristine. And it's testing very high. So this is really a new old stock tube. It's got large black plates with two, two rivets on each side and three ribs. Clear dome. And if we look way down, it's got one of those really large bar D-getters. So there's no gettering. The getter material is right in that bar, I believe. Okay, but how did they sound? Bass was okay. Maybe a bit muddy, with nice tone. Mid-range and treble was good plus. Clean, clear, and crisp, with good tone. Microphonics were low. This tube has lots of detail, good sound stage, maybe a bit dark. If your system is a bit bright, this might be your tube. Next, as a GE 6SN7 GTA or B. In this case, we're looking at the GTB version, but the GTA is virtually the same tube. Let's have a quick look at it. Again, the lettering is really nice. The pins are perfect. It's another new old stock tube, and with good print, we've got a great date code. 56, so 1956, the 26th week. Number 188 is the manufacturing code for GE. Now, if we didn't have that, let's look at the label on the glass. Can you see those little dots down there? It's really hard to see. They're really faint. That's a manufacturing code of some sort, and only GE used that as far as I know. So now you know it's a GE tube for sure got some medium-sized gray plates with four rivets, three ribs, a clear dome. Where the heck is the gettering? Well, the getter is behind here. Look at that. A really large amount of side gettering. You can't see the getter. It's tucked in behind there. Let's see if you can see it right through the tube. It's sort of a horseshoe. There it is. Sort of a horseshoe-shaped getter. I believe G did this to shorten the, the bottle size and get the getter off the top. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. Okay, so how did they sound? Bass was good plus. A touch forward with nice tone. Mid-range is very nice. Natural sounding and the music just popped. Treble was clean, clear, and crisp. Microphonics were medium minus. When I say medium minus, I mean a little less than medium. A little more would be medium plus. This tube had very good detail and a very nice sound stage. Overall, a very nice vintage tube, and in my opinion, one of the most underrated vintage 6SN7 GTA or Bs out there. Wow, that was a mouthful. I think its weakness has nothing to do with its sound. Its problem is appearance. It just isn't sexy. The short bottle was developed to help solve space issues with TVs. And with that change, 
it became a forgotten tube. Now this tube is highly reliable, but the earlier version, the tall plate 6SN7GT, was a crap tube. I've tested many poles and found most of them to be dead or dying. So definitely a vintage tube to avoid. Up next is a Northern Electric 6SN7. Say what? Yup. Another reissue using an old brand name. In this case, an exclusive product of the tube store imported from China and sold in a modern box. I had a look for a picture of a true vintage Northern Electric 6SN7. I've never seen one in the wild up, up close. And this doesn't look anything like it. I was also wondering, is this a GT, a GTA, or a GTB? Or something else? There's no data sheet showing up online and it's just labeled as a 6SN7. So I took a chance and I tried it in my prototype pre with the direct coupled interstage. Now that preamp eats lower rated 6SN7 GTs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So stick to the much higher rated GTA or GTB version. In this case, they lasted for 10 minutes, then one started whistling Always a bad sign, so I shut down and I made the save. Let's have a quick look at it up close. Got a really nice understated label. It's got fairly, well, medium-sized large boxy plates with these two holes on each side of the plate. So, ventilation or cooling holes. And don't they remind you of another really wonderful tube, the Philips E80CC has holes just like that. And in fact, uh, small Muller triodes have a little hole in the middle as well. Not that I'm comparing these directly to Muller's folks. I'm just We're just comparing design features. It's interesting. Because this is a modern interpretation of a, a really you know, vintage tube. It's got good solid supporting rods connecting up the mica. Top and bottom. Top and bottom. It's got a couple of ears here, so they're hard to see on camera, that helps support the tube in the glass envelope. And down below, it's got um, some really nice um, jacketing on the leads to keep them, you know, totally isolated. We don't want shorts in tubes, that's for sure. And when you have these elevated structures, it's probably a good idea if something moves around. We do not want a dead short got a really sweet brass base. Coated pins, which are already showing signs of wear. This is a used tube. Lightly used, the seller said. And I think so. The tests are they're testing pretty high. Um, coated pins, in my opinion, it's just cosmetics. It's a selling feature. Give me heavily tinned, bright pins any day of the week. They'll last the lifetime of the tube and beyond. Other than, you know, eh. But this is really nice. It's got a ceramic base. Look at that. You don't see that very often. Okay, so yeah, it's gorgeous. It's a pretty looking tube. It's a nice looking design. How do they sound? That's the big thing. Well, base was good plus with nice tone. Mid-range was good plus. Nice tone and clarity and treble was very nice. Clean, clear, and crisp. In fact, the treble is where this tube really shines. It had good detail and nice sound stage. Microphonics were medium minus. Overall a very nice sounding new tube. But they are expensive premium tubes. If you don't want to play around with vintage 6SN7s then this just might be your tube. Oh and I wanted to show you the box. The box is kind of pretty. But you know it's got this sort of matte plasticized canvas look to it, yeah, which is sort of okay, but you know, we're looking at a quasi reproduction vintage tube, and I, I don't know, let's, I'll show you something in a minute. Now this is really nice. They did this well. Look at this. Watch this. Some vintage manufacturers, particularly the Japanese, use these cones. In it goes, in the box it goes, it doesn't move around, it's great for shipping. This, that's well done, folks. That's really brilliant. Now, 
if you're going to copy this sort of design here, why not do a more understated set of graphics? Matte finish, two tones, nice logo, couple of stylized lightning bolts. That's really, you know, that's classy. That's a traditional Marconi box. Really beautiful. They're getting old. Many of these just aren't surviving anymore. So I have a small selection. So every once in a while somebody orders a really premium tube and they'll get a vintage box with it if I've got one. Okay, here's one of my favorite boxes for Sylvania, one of my favorite tube manufacturers. Just two colors, matte, nice Sylvania logo with some electrical lightning bolts across it. What, what more could you want, folks? To me, if I was going to build a beautiful tube like that, I would put an, you know, something that's more in keeping with the vintage feel of the tube. Okay, what's next? Up last is my Sylvania Jan 12SN7GT. Now, 12SN7s and 6SN7s are exactly the same tube. The only difference is the heater voltage. Some tube manufacturers, though, in the later days of the tube era, were running out of numbers, and they would go from a 6-something to a 12-something, and it would be a completely different tube. It wouldn't even have the same pinout. So be cautious about that. You can't just jump to conclusions. you got to check your data sheet out and see if, in fact, they're the same tube. In this case, Sylvania actually publishes a data sheet with the 6, the 12, uh, even the 8-volt version, all on the same data sheet. So you know they're the same tube. Now... This is from 1967, and you've seen me bring this interesting tube out in the past. But up until now, I've never been able to listen to it. First off, this tube is not a GT, even though it's labeled twice over that it's a GT. It was built to a military specification in 1967, and is probably a GTB. So why not label it a GTB? Well, what I think happened is the U.S. government put out a contract for a bunch of 6SN7 GTs. Because that's all the spec their equipment would have needed. But Sylvania had been making the much higher rated GTA and later the very similar GTB for at least a decade or more. So they just took the contract and labeled the tubes to match the order. Nobody could complain that the tube could handle an extra 150 volts on the plate or double the wattage. Okay, okay. Enough blah blah blah. How did it sound? Well, bass was good plus plus. Okay, let's forget about that. Let's just call it excellent. I avoid describing anything I review with that word, but in this case it's totally appropriate. Bass tone was very, very clean and detailed neutral and wonderful. Definitely the best bass of any 6 or 12 SN7 I've ever heard. Note this is neutral natural bass. Not for someone that likes to make the whole house shake. This is for the f a fan of acoustic jazz and small ensemble classical, which I am. Mid-range was good plus. Clean, clear, and crisp, with nice tone. Very natural. Treble was very nice. Clean, clear, and crisp, and neutral. In my notes, I wrote soundstage, soundstage, soundstage. Overall, a very nice vintage tube. Very three-dimensional. I'm going to award this the best 6 or 12 SN7 I've ever listened to. Now, how to compare it to the famous bad boys of the 1940s and 50s? Also Sylvania tubes. Not easy, because I don't have an amp that can play both tubes. I think they're both great tubes, but they are unique in their own tube type. The bad boys have wonderful bass as well, but they have a sound that reminds me a lot of my jazz recordings from the 1950s. Whereas this tube is a, I would, if I had to really say something to commit myself, I would say this is sort of a more refined version of the bad boy. 
Uh, each to his own, and this is why you have to roll different tubes, try them out. This does not make the bad boy in any way less of a tube. It's just another great tube to try. Okay, now I want to say something I've been thinking for a long time. I'm going to say it out loud. I think the 6SN7 GT and the GTA or B are two different tubes. Yes, they're in the same family. Yes, they have the same pinout. Yes, they work in similar circuits, but the specifications are very different. Okay, now, how did the preamp sound? It sure is neat that I can play any 6 or 12 SN7 GTA or B in the same, same preamp. The sound stage is what struck me. Now, what is sound stage? Basically, a nice three-dimensional positioning of the players and singers on a virtual stage in front of you. This is mostly a product of the recording and mastering engineers. But so what? It brings the music that much closer to a live presentation. To get a nice sound stage, good stereo separation is essential, good detail, as well as low distortion. And the speaker setup, probably more than anything else, is critical. And if you want to see something about speaker setup, watch Paul at PS Audio. He talks a lot about that. I'm sure he has a dedicated uh, YouTube on setting up your speakers. But the main focus of the prototype was never meant to be the preamp circuit. It was the dual mono power supply design, which I think is responsible for delivering the great stereo separation and wonderful sound stage. Let's have a quick look at the schematic had some ideas. Let's put it right side up for you folks. I get to look at it upside down. It's a good thing I'm familiar with it. So, here's an interesting fact. When this, when one of these channels is running with a, a signal present at moderate volumes, it only draws a handful of milliamps. And that's because this is primarily a voltage amplifier and it doesn't take a lot of amperage to run the circuit. So why do we have 34 milliamps on each side of our transformer if we only need a handful? Well, the reason for that is if we have a big crescendo, a large increase in volume, a rapid change in volume, we need power behind our circuit so that we can, we can meet those demands. And in higher end audio, Reserve power in the transformer or however your supply circuit's designed is an important detail. And I actually learned that from Paul at PS Audio. He talked about his very first, one of their early phono preamps and an experiment they did in which his, uh, his partner at the, at the time, Stan, um, swapped out a standard transformer in the phono stage and put in a much larger one. And Paul said, I couldn't believe the difference that made. I remember that little hint from Paul for ever in a day. I never forget a good, a good idea. So when it came to designing this power supply, I looked for something that wasn't too large, but gave me lots of reserves and was affordable. And in this case, we wanted, we have two power supplies in one package, basically. So we want that reserve. We're already running ultra fast diodes, so lower switching noise. In fact, the preamp is really quite quiet, so we could maybe think about going down to 10 Henry's and that would make for a little more efficient pass through the choke, but then we'd have a little bit more noise, so I'm not sure that's a good trade-off. We could take the dropping resistor to a really high value, a 5 or 10 watt wire wound. That might increase the efficiency through the resistor, but it would be very minor. That's a possibility. The bleeder resistor could go, and that would make our power supply more efficient, because we're losing a little bit of energy here all the time while we're operating. But this is an essential safety feature. So this, is, this has been in a couple of pieces of equipment already, and this is sitting on revision one for a very good reason, that I really don't see too many changes to make. But this preamp circuit itself, now that's different. Maybe there's some room here. Let's just zoom in on that a little closer so you can see it better. Let's just follow the audio path in. Here we're coming in and we're going through. This is one of the weak links of any piece of audio equipment. 
That's, that's the variable resistor or pot for short. Now we're already using a Blue Alps, which is a really decent quality um, uh, variable resistor. It's sort of the biggest bang for the buck kind of deal. We could use something that is called a uh, step attenuator, I believe. It's got fixed resistors around a rotary cylinder. Every time you click to the next resistor, that's your step in volume. The problem with that is you don't have an infinite volume control. With the Blue Alps, wherever you put the dial, if you need a little bit more volume, you just inch it up a little tiny bit, nudge it up a bit, and you're good. With the uh, steps, you click to the next step, and if that's too loud, there's no setting in between. So, I don't know. Here, though, we have a possibility. We have a coupling capacitor. That's keeping DC off the input, but this is, this is an audio or AC line right here. If we're confident that there's no DC or a good coupling cap in the previous stage, we can probably pull this out. That might be worth doing an experiment and seeing if we're good and safe here and what that does to that circuit. Next, we're, we've got a direct couple interstage here. There's no coupling capacitor. There's nothing to do here other than maybe put a coupling capacitor, but that's sort of going backwards from what we're talking about. Over here, we've got a coupling capacitor with DC high voltage present here at the cathode. That's essential that we have a coupling capacitor in place. But the value, this is sort of a general value. The value of this thing, in fact, this whole area here, even though this is primarily blocking the DC and allowing the AC signal through to our output, this is also forming a high pass filter. And you've got to be careful about this value. So you don't want to roll the base off too high, and you don't really want to roll it off too low either, because that could introduce the noise into the circuit. So we could possibly try a different coupling capacitor. So I've, I brought these in just for fun. These are inexpensive Chinese metal capacitors. Metal film, 3.3 microfarad instead of 2.2. That's not a big change in value. So we could pop that in. And uh, I've always wanted to know if these are any good. So some people rate quite highly of them as being a really good quality budget coupling capacitor. I've also got this this big monster here, it's rated for 450 volts, and we could try that in as well. They're all basically a similar type of coupling capacitor. If, if we had the budget, we could spend $100, $200, we could spend $1,000 on a handmade, hand-rolled coupling capacitor, but Bells and Moore is not willing to give tube lab that kind of money for just experimenting. But if somebody has a pair of coupling capacitors they think might be nice in here, as a little test, why don't you loan them to me and we could try it out. Okay, let's just clear the decks here. Let's just see what came in this week. There's always interesting stuff. Well, you've got to see this. Have a look at this. Bags and bags and bags wrapped up in, in tissue paper. And what are these things? These are vintage used Russian 6N23Ps. They're reflectors. And um, they are a very close equivalent to the six, much loved um, preempt to the 6922, which is the higher performing version of the 6DJ8. Now, why the heck do I bring in lots and lots of one type of used tube? Well, a lot of these tubes are garbage. Uh, typically, I'll throw out close to 40% of a large order of used tubes. Sometimes it's as low as 10%. God help me, sometimes it's higher. The only, if you, you wanted to try two of these Russian tubes, you would have to and you needed a pair, let's say, for your preamp, you've got to buy at least 20. You're going to throw out 40% of them. Don't keep the garbage. It's just nobody's ever going to use that stuff. And then you're going to want to match up a couple of nice pairs. So maybe you'll end up with four good tubes out of 20. So anyways, we'll get those on the tester, and they'll be in the store soon. 
In fact, we're working on a prototype preamp that takes that tube. What else came in? Oh, look at these. Really nice KT88. Gold lines. Genelux. Now, these are meant to be sort of a reissue KT88. They're, they're actually made... Um, the parent company is New Sensor, which I believe is based in New York. And the plant, though, is the reflector plant in Saratov, Russia, where I think all the new sensor tubes are made. Really nice base. People really like this particular tube. Now, you may notice that the label's on top. Don't put labels on metal bases, and for God's sake, don't put a black marker on them. I got most of the marks off the base, but there's still a little bit, you can still see a little bit that's left. If you put a label on it, it discolors the aluminum, and there's no way to fix that easily. It's done. Really quite a robust looking power tube, isn't it? I can't wait. We've got um, the Wilsonton amp, <laughs> Integrate amp, it's coming in, and it plays KT88, so we'll be reviewing these tubes in that amp. So that'll be really good. I've got quite a few of these around. What else came in? Okay, here's something really boring. A box of switches. Now, why would I talk about switches? Well, I don't like using rotary switches. I like using these, these um, double pole and single pole double throw switches. And I use really high values. 15 amp contact rated fuses. The reason I like them is I get a really large contact surface and very, very low resistance as well as reliability. I use a lot of them. So we've got, we can throw to one side or the other, and we've got to center off on these switches. And single pole or double pole, I keep quite a few in stock. Um, and I use them constantly in my builds. Really like these switches. They're not that expensive. Oh, okay, you ready folks? Up last is a huge box. Oh my God, let's back up. Seems like we're making a habit of big boxes. Now this is a, I think it's pronounced Kossor. Kossor was a, um, was a, a huge um, early vintage tube manufacturer. Way back when these guys made um, the glass vessels for scientific research before the tube era started. And then of course when the tube era started they were perfectly positioned to start making vacuum tubes. Eventually, they sold part of the company off to Philips, and uh, Raytheon bought the other half. And the history, let's get something to open that up with. The history of the company is really fascinating. You should check it out on, um, on Wikipedia. So these are sort of a reissue reproduction 300B. Look at that. Now that that's the way to package tubes. Big expensive tubes. So there you've got a really nice understated label. These are a Chinese reproduction tube. We got some really nice big black plates in a plus sign sort of configuration or an X configuration. We've got a pair of nice upper micas. Now this is from the, um, the company called P.S. Vein, or pronounced Pavain. They make very high-end, very expensive tubes. Let's see if we can see that double getter. It's really worth looking at. It's really quite pretty. It's a nice looking tube, very nice ceramic base, nice pins. I like the understated logo. I'm hoping these sound really great. And we'll have a review of 300B tubes eventually. We're working on a prototype, uh, single-ended build. The transformers just actually came in this week, but it's going to be a while before we get a circuit designed together and get something built we can actually listen to. Okay, well that was a lot of fun. And if you stay to the end, here's some discount codes. Remember I've got $20 flat rate global shipping, and if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is free. Stay safe everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.